Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the eastern border. Sorry for this taking so long, but, um, well, tell you what, dealing with funerals is um, not a fun experience and uh, extremely costly. Thankfully, I uh, have some savings, but oh, that certainly did cut into my budget. But, you know, we'll manage. We'll work, we'll work harder, as usual. That's what Dad would have wanted anyways. However, the thing is that uh, the hardest part about this episode wasn't just recording this and writing the script. It was about figuring out what to cut from this situation, because otherwise, you know, I want to make a short news update episode before I get back to my longer stuff. However, I need to update you on the news, the news things and then things that... Um, you know, you already probably know from the mainstream media, they kind of have to go. Otherwise, why would, why, why would you listen to my show if I would just repeat main talking points of what you've heard elsewhere? And secondly, stuff that is just also kind of silly also needs to go. So tons of tons of cutting stuff out. One thing, though, I do need to make a joke about how, yes, indeed, there was a single T-34-85 tank in, in the whole 9th of May parade. Which we all found kind of funny, and that, you know, if you're not on Twitter already, you should probably go, because tons of memes were plastered all over the place. Secondly, and this is a special thing that I want to mention in the beginning, because a lot of you quite skipped the end, uh, which is why, you know, uh, also I'm going to post uh, this thing separately. Uh, History and Fire is now doing a rerun of his Mad Baron of Mongolia series. This uh, Estonian guy, Estonian white Russian guy, a very weird person... <clears throat> totally 100% not a relative of our friend from, from History Impossible. Oh, hello, cat. Yeah, of course, he's coming, and he, he was just sitting there peacefully, but now he's coming back. <laughs> well, basically, uh, Daniele is doing a very good rerun of, of his, his series, and if you haven't listened to them, I think they might have been you know, in a paywall when he first did it. I'm not sure exactly, but he does them justice. I highly recommend you do, do, do go to History on Fire and give uh, that, those series a listen. And, and yeah otherwise i might be a bit awkward but that's because i haven't recorded for a while and has to deal with all this stuff and i i hope you'll for- forgive me but um i do have some things that i need to talk to you about here first of all the bombing of zahar prilepin this nationalist writer and as he calls himself politician yeah that that thing was awkward because we also have some interesting comments about the whole situation from well more military educated people so, what happened was that uh, a car bombing, also the Nizhny Novgorod, injured this Zakhar Prilepin guy. Um, uh, th- there's a bunch of other rude nicknames th- that I've uh, accidentally cut out from this, because, well, not accidentally, I just thought that, um, yeah, Zalupa Prihurin pri- pri- and-, and other things are just very calm from this. Telegram channel Baza reported that Prilepin's daughter was riding in the car with him, but that she got out of the car before the explosion. Um, the car's driver, who was also Prilepin's bodyguard, was killed. And um, apparently, as we as we know, well, uh, the driver, who was a total you know military person, uh, his nickname was Zloy or Evil. I mean, if you, if your nickname is Evil, what do you expect? And the thing is that well, he was. Apparently in a critical condition, he got a surgery and everything, and uh, and yeah, again, again, already I have seen in the past few days, people are trying to portray this as you know they're killing journalists, but they're forgetting the fact that um, Zakhar Prilepin had been very open about how his group and how you know his people and he, the people he organized were very very you know responsible for many deaths of Ukrainians and how he himself had shot a bunch. So that just makes him very, you know, legitimate military target. And that's the thing, uh, which, which is what I don't do in these hot hot zones when I get there, is um, yeah, take up guns and everything, because I do follow the international rules of everything, and I mark myself clearly as press, which is why, if you've seen my pictures, I've had this blue helmet on. It also can be black, it doesn't matter. And the clear label saying press, unlike the Russian so-called war corps, who just, you know, fo- make photos with... with Machine guns on them and everything. And Zakhar Prilepin was a true piece of work. Completely. And, well, he was just as bad as his driver. And the thing is... The thing is that he also gave an accounting of, of his, you know, how, how, you know, everything happened. And it doesn't really matter. You might have heard that one Alexander Permyakov, who was arrested in connection to this, confessed. But it makes no sense. 
The biggest issue with the whole fact is that, again, again, the National Republican Army uh, they took responsibility for this, which uh, our friend Ilya Ponomarev said this was created by them. But, um, yeah, he said it about Dugin uh, and, and all the other explosions. I'm, I'm not really buying that stuff. One thing that we know for sure is that Zakhar Prelepin's story is that apparently there was an explosion, there was an anti-tank mine dug into into this village into this village that he was visiting, and that his car drove over it, and apparently, well, it was exploded, and, you know, he was in the driver's seat, and and the, the, this Loy guy, he was in the passenger seat at the time, and he died, and he himself with broken legs, out of which was like an open, broken stuff, he managed to crawl out, and he's still like a pretty bad condition because one of the bro- one of the you know bro- broken legs was an open you know broken situation. And as I as recently as last year broke my own you know leg. Yeah, well, uh, I'm glad glad that I didn't have um, any broken bones in my last thing, just bruised stuff and wounds. Still, they um, being my age, that is thirty three, wounds take a long time to heal, really bad. So you know he's not going to be. On his feet, <laughs> evil pun intended here, uh, anytime soon. Now, there's a bit of a problem about this whole situation and his story, which he really doesn't tell you, because I don't believe this uh, version that Zakhar Prilepin was exploded there, because, for one, that so-called village that he was driving through when he was exploded near Nizhny Novgorod, it's not really a village, it's a single street. There's only like two and th- two to three permanent residents there who are all fishermen, because the village consists of dachas. It's it's kind of a single street surrounded by summer homes with a really terrible um, cell phone coverage over that overall. So if if kind of um if if this would be some sort of phone activated bomb, yeah, that would be really difficult and terrible because it just wouldn't work. Secondly, if that was really an anti tank mine, then you know there would be no car. There would be no Zakhar Prilepin. It certainly was something else. And finally, I just can't imagine, because, you know, making such bombs specifically timed is really weird, and not like anyone would, you know, not like anyone would really understand how to make one if they were like an amateur. And here I quote to my source, um, one of of the guys said that, you know, making these bombs and exploding them is, is kind of not like, hello, Mr. Agent Ivanov, please sign your papers, you will now blow Zakhar Prilepin, here is the anti-tank mine number one, Uh, this is the anti-tank mine number two, which you will then fail to explode, dig them into the earth, and sign off. Congratulations, comrade, you are now a vetted agent. It just doesn't work that way. So, it's all nonsense. And secondly, it was kind of a detour, and, and like I said, only two to three people who are all fishermen live in that village. So if someone from the outside would come in, yeah, that would be viewed with a lot of suspicion. Like, that would definitely not be a thing that they would not notice. You know, like in, in all small kind of towns and everything, people notice that stuff. It's just very suspicious, and I do believe it's more like... It's, a, it's another one of those things where, well, he got damaged in an explosion. We don't know who did it. However, well... Not like anyone cares, might as well be, you know, internal things, might as well be everything, because, again, the internal disputes are uh, are definitely growing larger in Russia, and that's what we're going to talk about next, as I promised you in, in my last a bit more, you know, panicky episode, and I'm sorry about that, about, well, Prigozhin, because our Wagner group friend is being very active lately, and just to run a little reminder... In the recent weeks, Wagner, private military company, also pensioners trying to not die, and the military cartel, whatever, Prigozhin, has been owner of that, that place, has been publicly denouncing Russia's military leadership very frequently and super furiously. On May the 5th video, he addressed Defense Minister Shoigu and General Chief, Staff Chief Valery Gerasimov, and, uh, well, he released a stream of... Um, proper Soviet Panyachia levels of mat, accusing the, hmm, these guys of letting Russians die so that they could get fat in their offices of rich mahogany. And four days later on Tuesday, he published a longer video, this time accusing a Russian army unit of abandoning its positions, a 72nd regiment, mind you, in Bakhmut, before referring to a quote-unquote happy grandpa who's failing to save his country. And, um, all the situation is being really angering this whole situation. Uh, 
see, Prigozhin has demanded that, you know, he, he'd been complaining about this lack of, of, uh, of shells and artillery blasts and everything, and now we found out what he means, because in one, one recent, recent interview with the, one of the guys who's kind of an artillery dude, apparently, apparently they um, basically... The proper amount how Wagner Group wants to use uh, of, of these shells on attacks is about 200 per, per day. 200 shells per day from for, for a single artillery gun is a bit much on these levels. And it doesn't even count the, the amount of, you know, barrels that we need to shift. Yeah, Wagner Group considers that to be normal. Everything less would be bad. And as Girkin has also mentioned, well, Wagner Group just complains about the lack of resources and everything, you know, sent to them. Because, well, they've been treated like a luxury in this army to achieve their personal promise he made to Putin. And now he can't do this. And it's all... It's all a bit weird right now, since it just shows that it's not because of any super military tactics or competency that they've been you know, doing all these things. It's just because they've been given insane amounts of resources and, like, they've been throwing men and shells at people. That's kind of crazy. At least, I don't know, guys, 200 shells per gun per day, to me, in such a, such a combat situation in Bakhmut where they can't even take it, seems a bit much, right? Uh, maybe you guys can fix this up. I don't know. At any rate... <laughs> Public attacks against uh, against this whole against everything here, you know, this whole situation basically started by by him demanding the defense ministry give him the ammunition necessary for Wagner Group to continue firing in Bakhmut, and he threatened to withdraw his fighters from their positions five days later, just you know, basically yesterday, tenth uh, of May, if his request was denied. On May the 6th, Ramzan Gadirov, another old pal of ours whom we haven't seen in a long time, asked Vladimir Putin to send his Ahmad battalion to replace the Wagner forces in Bakhmut, a proposal for which Prigozhin expressed approval. Also laughing it off, since, uh, well, everyone here knows that <laughs> all these Ahmad battalion, they're just TikTok warriors who can storm uh, uninhabited buildings with zero people in them and who have no experience with actual fighting. The next day after this response, Prigozhin reported that the Russian Defense Ministry had agreed to provide him with ammunition after all, and that the Wagner Group would remain in Bakhmut. A day later, however, he posted a 27-minute video in which he said his forces had received just 10% of the equipment he had requested and began threatening Russia's military leadership once again. He also alleged that the Russian armed forces unit in Bakhmut had like abandoned its positions. And the, the most widely discussed part, at least in the Russian internet, was, uh, was the one where he... Well, he mentioned the angry, ha sorry, happy grandpa, quote, There are the people who fight, and there are people who learned at some point in their lives that they should have reserves. And they hoard, hoard, hoard these reserves. And instead of spending a shell killing the enemy, saving the life of our soldier, they kill our soldiers. Meanwhile, the happy grandpa thinks he's doing well. And what's the country supposed to do next? If he turns out to be right, God bless everyone. But what should the country do? What should our children, our grandchildren, the future of Russia do? And how will we win this war if suddenly, and I'm just speculating here, it turns out that this grandpa is a complete dickhead? End quote. See, the problem here being that, um, well, we all know whom Happy Grandpa is addressed to. And secondly, um, he might as well be right. Because again, you know, people have been yelling at me when I say that it's quite likely, extremely likely, and I firmly believe this, that Russia is just going to fall apart as they lose this war, which I, again, I do believe that they will. And then Prigozhin, you know, he's hinting at these things. Even Prigozhin's doing that. They're just Girkin, who's also switched to this mode of, of thinking. And at one point, you know, I am... Um, and I don't believe this is going to come from any external pressure. Oh, no, no. I just think that the internal struggles between Prigozhin and Ramzan Khadirov is going to just, you know, split it all apart and going to do crazy things. But, um, but yeah, it's not being unnoticed. Of course, people are making fun of him, including Girkin, stating that, um, well, of course, he is just used to this luxury stuff. But um, there are also people there who are, like, really viewing this. Uh, Kremlin's officials, sources known to me and my colleagues, view this stuff as actually a real threat. Basically, a lot of people think he's not a part of the same team and not out of, not working for the same interests, and that uh, apparently Prigozhin has his own project, Bakhmut, and he's currently doing everything for its sake, but he's failing this, miserably. And that's his personal project aimed at giving him more influence and everything, and that Wagner becomes the more main force behind victory, and he's, well, failing a bit this situation completely. And the statement about Happy Grandpa was received even more negatively, obviously. And, uh, quote, 
He can say later on, of course, that he was talking about Shoigu or some theoretical lay, layman, but we know what conclusions people will draw. And yeah, some sources say that indeed he was talking about Putin like everyone thinks, but uh, another, you know, people, another person commented that statement can't really be considered a direct attack on the president. And again, this is whole thing about Prigozhin making a certain promise to Putin that he would capture Bakhmut by a certain date. And this is where knowledge of Panyatia comes on. As you know, I'm as you're listening to this, I'm recording and writing my my article for for Foreign Policy magazine. I have to finish by I have to finish it in a couple of hours. It's gonna be fine. But um, if you remember about some things about promises given in prison and in that culture, he made a promise, and he is from that culture through and through, and so is Putin. So we all know what a promise made by one kind of, um, you know, higher up in Bratwa to another one, what really, what, what this really means. So he's right to get panicky, because even if he's not punished officially, unofficially, according to Panyatia, he's going to lose a lot of his status. Because and sources confirm this, quote, because of this personal promise, he's throwing the regular troops under the bus and making provocative statements. It's unconventional behavior. And apparently, well, prigozhin has gone a bit too far. He's crossed some sort of red line. And that's all sort of weird. Basically, the journalists out there in, in the mainstream Russian propaganda should start portraying him as a traitor and blame these, you know, bl- blame failures in the front on, or on his um, luxury treatment and all this stuff. And the fact how this has cost, you know, good troops from LNR and DNR, uh, you know, stuff elsewhere. That's obviously not going to happen because they're going to deal with this. As far as I know from my own personal investigations and sources that there's a major mistrust on the front. The regular troops don't trust Wagner guys, and it's a mess. And as we've seen in the previous days, the counter, like the, the attacking parts in Bakhmut, where Wagner groups now surrounded, and probably soon we're just gonna lose them completely, as I believe they're gonna get eliminated. Yeah, the mistrust is happening on them. And seeing that, uh, as far as we know, and again, I'm not gonna even mention mostly about the whole Ukrainian counteroffensive, because that seems stupid, because everyone and, grandma, and their grandma does this even without any previous knowledge. What we know about this for sure is that uh, Russia has chosen a solid wall strategy instead of the thing that they're best at, which is defense and depth. The problem is that the solid wall strategy with their positions that they've dug out will only work if they have a cohesive, well-trained force which is well-supplied and everyone knows where to fire and how overlapping lines of fire work. Now, of course, you, uh, I'm ready to bet anyone who says that this is exactly what's going to happen, but I'm thinking they're just going to throw, you know, some three-day train mobics on the line who don't even care about them and who hate their bosses, who might be from DNR, and they're going to serve in the next trench to the Wagner group or Chechens, you know, the Kadyrov troops from Chechnya, and they're going to shoot each other as much as they shoot the, the Ukrainians, and it's going to turn into a massive mess. Uh, my money's on that part. So I wouldn't really worry about that, and I think the whole, you know, Ukrainian... The Ukrainian trickle down news about how this operation is going to go. Yeah, that's going to be very interesting because, once again, criminalization of this whole society and infighting continues. And I would like to end this one with uh, very interesting news. Again, it, it comes from Voronezh, I think. Uh, I lost the specific city in notes, but basically, one of the guys who had been fighting in this war, and I think he was a volunteer the early war, had returned home from his home village. And this comes from Gulagunet's site, by the way. Because that's a reliable source, and we have some responses. Well, basically, what's hap- what happened was that there were guys with this dude in the center, you know, these you know, groups of people, quite young, actually, because, you know, not like elderly people last long in this situation. Quite young people, you know, the guy comes back home from war, gets his aggressive buddies around him, and they just spotted some guys in their local village, I think it really was outside Voronezh, but I might be mistaken. Might as well be Nizhny Novgorod. Like, my notes... My notes are a bit clogged at this point. So, what happened was that he just came out to these guys and yelled at them for just drinking beer while he was out there fighting. And these other guys, well, decided to, you know, just get off of this and told them that told him that you know when we were when we'll get conscripted and when we when we when we shall be called to war they will go and fight and they just try to leave and apparently this more aggressive group with this ex-soldier in the center they try to follow the guys uh, to, to their homes and they did and well everyone what ended up, what ended up happening is like in one of these villages village houses in in uh, the yard of, of the house uh, they started beating up his friends in the group and then they started like beating him up and then they started, like, choking his wife and threatening rape. 
And the guy who was like beaten up at this point he just ran into his house and grabbed his own like you know hunting a hunting rifle. Uh, I presume it was like a Saiga or something because we we're talking about many shots here. And I you really can't keep Kalashnikovs at home in Russia as as much as you know Hollywood TV would like to point out otherwise. So what happened was this: this guy runs in after getting beaten up in a group after trying to avoid the conflict and after his wife is being choked at his own like backyard and threatened with rape. So he goes in, grabs a gun shoots in the air as a few warning shots, and then he just didn't give a crap and just started opening fire at these these people with this group. Uh, two dead, two, two, two severely wounded. Uh, among, among the dead, the main instigator of this whole incident, the, the ex-military guy. And apparently he got a huge procession, because, like, it wasn't really reported, because this just happened, like, today when I'm recording this, has, uh, you know, he might as well be from Wagner Group or whatever, but what we know is that he has a massive funeral procession and, like, it was a bit weird because he was still portrayed as a hero. And now from the village where they're at, uh, yeah, the, the people are trying to, you know, make some, make some, some things happen so that the blame isn't shifted on the guy who is just defending his family. The criminalization of the Russian society, ladies and gentlemen, once again, exactly like I warned you about. At any rate, uh, first of all, as we end this, I'd like to give my condolences to the family of Arman, of Arman Solden, who's from against Agents France Press, AFP, basically, the French press agency, an international news agency, who reported that, well, one of their one of their journalists, age 32, who was video coordinator for coverage of Ukraine, was killed in Shasivyar, close to Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine, and that's another colleague from my profession, from actual war journalists who have passed away. But, you know, at this point, I think I'm sadly gotten used to this. My condolences to him, his colleagues, and his family. And also, well, we're back to making the show. It's a bit harder than it was before, but we'll we'll push through. We'll get to Ukraine back again. It's just that I just hate when my plans get thrown away and, you know, have to redo everything a lot. T-shirts are going to be sent very soon. Don't worry about that. We're, we'll, we'll manage that, that stuff. We've, we've got in your emails. I hope I have answered to everyone. If I haven't, I will recheck everything specifically tomorrow, and then things are going to happen. If you are a patron of our show, well, then thank you for that, and and you have a chance of getting that one for free. I posted an update there about uh, this whole situation. And if you want to become our patron, then our Patreon is patreon.com slash the eastern border, or you can just Google up the eastern border Patreon. We'll be very thankful for this, because... Again, we had a ton of expenses recently. Secondly, if you want to listen to the show without advertisements and just support the show with a one-time donation, you, you, or you can set up a monthly payment there, you can go to our homepage, theeasternborder.lv, and click the donate button there. That'll be much appreciated. We'll be back with more news and some interviews when I just get back into the, the, the working rhythm. Now I have an article to finish. And again, go check out our friends at History on Fire, and, uh, yeah, if any one of you listening to this is on Twitter or on Facebook, and I know many of you are, please tag Daniele Bellelli, because I, you know, I kind of promised him I would, because I honestly love his series about the Mad Baron of Mongolia exactly that much to be advertising another show totally unrelated to mine at this point. Except I was on that show, and he's my old friend, but the specific series, go listen to them. They're great. And we'll be back with more news very soon. And um, as always, as I remind myself in these past few months, happiness is mandatory.